Okay, good afternoon uh, all. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to our WMG uh, group colloquium. Today we have a great speaker and it's my privilege to uh, introduce our speaker, Professor Sean Lean from the University of Galway, Ireland. Sean Lean is the established chair of mechanical engineering at University of Galway since December 2008. He previously worked as an associate professor and a reader at the University of Nottingham from 1999 to 2008, uh, where he completed his PhD with Professor Tom Hyde and in the offshore oil and gas industry with MCS International. Now that group is called as Wood Group Kenny. Sean has a significant experience in large collaborative research projects including principal investigator funded by SFI, EPSRC, European Space Agency, and other sources such as Irish Research Council, totaling about 10 million SPI, primarily covering themes such as macro, meso, and microscale materials modeling, with application to structural integrity design, fatigue, fretting, wear, corrosion, plasticity, etc., and manufacturing processes for a range of engineering applications, including offshore, aerospace, power generation, and energy systems. Sean is presently a co-PI in the IFARM Center for Advanced Manufacturing in Ireland, with a focus on computational solid mechanics for process structure property performance in additive manufacturing of metals. Today, Sean is going to present uh, on the topic of effects of manufacturing processes on mechanical behavior, process structure property performance modeling. Sean, thank you very much uh, for taking your time to present uh, talk to our group and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Prakesh. Um, hopefully you can hear me OK, yeah? Yeah, yeah. OK, great. Um, I'll get started. Um, and I'd also like to thank, before we start, um, Sumit Prakesh. Uh, thanks very much, Sumit, for inviting me to give this presentation when we met at ESA Forum in Toulouse back in May, I think. So, um, OK, uh, Prakesh has said the title of my talk, which is Effects of Manufacturing Processes and Mechanical Behaviour. And I think probably you've all heard the phrase process structure property performance or PSP, P I'm calling it. Um, Certainly you've heard of process structure property, I presume. So, and it's, it's about modeling basically. Um, and okay, there's lots of affiliations down there in the bottom right, um, in the bottom left, sorry. Uh, and you can see a photograph of the quad, the old quadrangle um, part of the University of Galway, which was established in 1849, around about the time of the famine in Ireland, actually. So it was originally called Queen's College Galway, actually. Just a quick outline then, I'll, give, I'll talk a little bit about the University of Galway. And then I'll talk a little bit about engineering at the University of Galway. And then I'll move on and talk about some of the research that we're conducting in the IFARM Center for Advanced Manufacturing, which is funded by Science Foundation Ireland in, in Ireland. Um, um, and that'll be on mainly on additive manufacturing, actually. And then if there's time, I've got a couple of slides about a new project that we have um, started. Um, on the same kind of idea, process structure property performance, uh, in this case for offshore wind structural support, uh, support structures or structural steel. Um, uh, sorry. Um, okay, so just um, briefly then, um, maybe just a little bit about some of the kind of high level stats. I mean, maybe, you know, um, Galway is about, it's ranked about, it's in the top 2% of universities according to the QS World Rankings, but in terms of the impact rankings, um, which you may know about, which looks at basically the performance of universities for sustainable, in relation to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, then in fact we're the first in Ireland and probably I think within probably 47 in the world. So in terms of sustainable um, goals, we're quite good. Uh, we're also quite good, I suppose, overall, but um, a long way behind Warwick, which is, I think, about 67 on the QS World Rankings when I checked this morning. So um, that's some of the stats. We've got about 19,000 students, um, and then you can see some of the some of the other um, stats there. But um, um, sorry, I'm just going to get my slides to to move forward here. So just in terms of the Sustainable Development Goals, then I think 
certainly over the last period of um, let's say five or so years, maybe maybe a little longer. Then we certainly do try to use the SDGs to uh, give a kind of a thematic focus and maybe some kind of coherency to our research. Um, and I think you know we've done quite well. I think um, probably fifth in the world. I think for number twelve there, responsible consumption and production. And then we're, we're also scored quite highly in sustainable cities and communities and life below water. In fact, Galway has a large marine theme. You probably saw one of my research um, centre affiliations at the start was MARI, which is the Marine and Renewable Energy Research um, in Ireland uh, centre. Uh, we have a large marine institute in Galway and, you know, it's the west coast of Ireland. So perhaps that, that is too surprising that we score quite well on on the life below water theme. Uh, School of Engineering then, well, we're about 74 staff or so. Um, so not huge. Um, I think Sumit told me that there's a lot more in the manufacture, Warwick Manufacturing Group, maybe, I, I think I think you might've said 400 or something, which is quite amazing. Um, yeah. We've got about 1600 students, um, 12 engineering programs. Um, they're accredited by Engineers Ireland, which is the equivalent, the Irish equivalent of the IMECI in the UK, um, and then Athena Swan Silver Award, um, and then obviously some other information there about our publications. So 30, about you know more than 35% publications in the top 10% of journals, and and we try to focus on international collaborations and of course publications with industry etc. Um, and then of course we've lots of partnerships with industry. Uh, we were we have a like probably like a lot of universities in the UK, we have a very successful um, placement program where our students, undergraduate students, spend nine months in industry. And that's obviously excellent in terms of the interactions with industry and in terms of jobs for those students afterwards and making them aware of, the, of what industry requirements, et cetera, and in terms of their overall professional development. Um, and then I suppose a big theme on the West Coast of Ireland, in particular in Galway, a big theme in Galway, I would say, Galway is, is a med tech hub. It's one of the largest, one of the five global med tech hubs. So, you know, 14 out of the 15 top global companies are based here. And Ireland is the world's largest exporter of stents, for example. So some interesting stats. And then there's, there's um, a very large, a very successful innovation center called Ireland, or BioInnovate Ireland, which was established in Galway in 2011. It's led to 33 startups raised a lot of, uh, you know, more than 200 million euro in funding. And, you know, one in, Ir one in eight Irish med tech companies have come from BioInnovate. That's, and that's very, very strongly linked, um, founded really in the university. So academics have driven that with, with industry. Um, so there's some other stats there in the table on the right. Um, so then maybe moving on to the, to the uh, more research kind of, um, aspect then in terms of the background then I suppose the background is manufacturing and of course within the EU manufacturing is very important um, uh, like I suppose throughout the rest of the world uh, but 30 million jobs directly in the EU 80% um, of total EU export um, and so it's, it's really important and, and particularly important is this transition from traditional manufacturing to advanced manufacturing and this is a slide which one of my PhD students um, put together a couple of years ago, actually. And at the time, he said that um, it, it, the information he got was that, it, surprisingly, in a survey conducted, 50% uh, of EU manufacturing companies had not adopted advanced manufacturing technologies and didn't have plans to do that in the near future at that point. Um, so that's a big challenge, I suppose, to try and encourage um, you know, industry to, I suppose, adopt advanced manufacturing technologies. Uh, within iForm, then, which is this research centre that that I'm I'm, I'm working within, it, it's a national research centre. It's actually led from Dublin, um, and Galway is a partner in that. Uh, you can see some of the, the the kind of the structure and the thematic some of the thematic um, um, aspects on the left hand side in that kind of pie chart diagram on the left hand side. There's a big focus on cyber physical systems, obviously, um, but if we look on the right hand side of the bar chart, we can see that. Um, Ireland actually is somewhat lagging um, the EU in terms of the various digital technologies related to manufacturing. So, um, or in, in fact, in, in industry in general. So I suppose 
what that's saying is that to a certain extent, the EU isn't necessarily doing that awfully well. And, and again, maybe Ireland is even um, a little bit lagging. So there's almost a, quite an urgent need to try and support manufacturing in Ireland, I suppose, is the key thing. Um, OK, so then, um, so what is I-Form then? Um, in fact, I-Form has just gone into phase two, but within phase one, um, which is just finished last October, then basically, you know, it's led from UCD, as I said, and we have other partners, DCU, Dublin City University is a key partner where the co-director comes from. So the director is from UCD, his name is Dennis Dowling, Professor Dennis Dowling. TCD, so Trinity College Dublin are part of that. NIBERT is Biopharmaceuticals Research in Dublin, which is an um, industry-focused research centre. Galway is here on the left, and then some other partners are Atlantic Technological University, Maynooth University, Southeastern Technological University and University of Limerick as well. And you can see some of the stats there, more than 120 researchers. Um, I suppose quite a lot of research funding. It's not a huge research centre, but um, it's, it's reasonably big. So about 45 million in research funding and um, EU funded projects and industry partner projects as well. Oops, sorry. So um, then just to, I mentioned phase one and phase two, we've just started phase two, which is about six years that'll be going on to um, maybe something like 2029, it started in October 2023. Um, and you can see here the kind of idea that the, the, the layout of this center or the rationale is that we've got three, we've got platforms and spokes. And the platforms are kind of core research themes, which are maybe, maybe slightly more lower TRLs. And then the, the spokes are more industry partner projects. Um, and the, so you can see here, there are three platforms. One is on experimental characterization, really. Uh, platform two is on modeling. That's the area I work on. And platform three is applied AI then. And the kind of rationale is that we, we're basically going to try and develop you know, what we call multi-scale, multi-physics characterization and modeling um, for AM processes, but then try and um, somehow encapsulate that in digital toolboxes using AI methods, code surrogates, uh, code acceleration methods, and so, and so on and so forth, and then uh, work with industry to basically apply these digital tools uh, which are developed to, um, to, to help uh, develop and sustain advanced manufacturing development in industry in, in Ireland and, and, and abroad. Um, of course, sustainability is a key theme. So there's a couple of um, bullet points here which show the idea of trying to develop digital twins to help with, um, with I suppose, I suppose with sustainability. The idea probably the idea is to somehow leverage from advances in digitalization to make industrial processes and um, society more sustainable. Um, and I think that's some of what's being show, shown on the, on this slide, really. I suppose. Um, so then um, moving on to the kind of maybe closer to the theme that I'm, I'm really going to talk about, which is materials process modeling, then I just show some of the kind of key players within iForm then uh, here on this slide. So the, the director is Dennis Dowling at UCD, and then some of the PIs on platform two, which is the, the, the modeling platform, are Alo Zivankovic, Dermot Brabazon, and myself are the kind of the PIs leading it, if you like. So allies and myself lead the platform. And then other investigators, David Brown, UCD, Philip Cardiff, Noel Harrison at Galway, Ming Ming Tang at Galway, and Neil Murphy at UCD as well. And some of the international collaborators you see there, Manchester, Nottingham, um, India in, at, in Madrid, there's Materials Institute in Madrid, and um, Nanjing Tech, or I collaborate with them myself, and also ASTAR in Singapore, some of you may know, may know a star. Um, so the platform theme, um, platform two theme, I should say, is focused on um, what we call multi-scale, multi-physics modeling for um, advanced manufacturing, but really with a focus on additive manufacturing. Um, and I suppose the idea is to try to capture the key physical phenomena, thermal, fluid, chemical, phase transformation, um, interactions, etc. Somehow, um, obviously, using using multi-scale, multi-multi-physics computational methods, and ideally within an open-source um, platform, um, and then to capture uh, to represent these in process structure property relationships, 
Um, and then, of course, this, the, the computational models and methods need to be validated experimentally um, and then ultimately applied, as I said, for, for optimization of manufacturing processes, um, hopefully with the, within machine learning and web apps, for example. And we've done some of that in phase one, and we're going to expand that further in phase two as well. So this kind of multi-scale multi approach then is, is very much starts at the nanoscale. And um, some of that work has been done in phase one on molecular dynamics, looking at, um, I suppose, features like stacking faults, um, grain boundary formation, dislocation evolution, et cetera. And then ultimately feeding that up into a micro scale um, where it, it, what we've done so far is we've developed cellular automata and phase field modeling. I'll show some of that applied to powder flow, melt characterization, um, solid state phase transformations, et cetera. And then ultimately looking at, and of course, solidification processes. And then at a meso or maybe arguably also a micro scale, looking at crystal plasticity type methods, for example, with, within finite element to look at how grains interact for the performance or property characterization, looking at um, behavior like fatigue, for example, to try to characterize the lifetime of materials um, and, and components. And then ultimately, um, within phase two, there's a particular focus on trying to apply this to the part scale. So real component level is the challenge that we're trying to do there and look at the various effects um, that are that are important there. So we'd be looking at looking at trying to develop self-consistent, so self-consistent methods or continuum level methods for that process structure property um, linkages across those various scales. I'll just show some examples. This is an example of discrete element modeling of powder bed formations. It's work conducted within iForm by colleagues at UCD using the light software, and it looks at the powder compaction process in additive manufacturing, for example. And here's a comparison between some of the results from those simulations, from those um, discrete element simulations, compared against experimental data um, for, for sample powder. This is a, a, an animation rendered, um, you know, it, it's, it's a finite volume animation using open foam to look at the um, laser melting of those particles. Um, I'm not showing the details of the mathematics, et cetera, here. And, and it's really just a nice um, animation rendering the, the physics. Um, for more specific, I suppose, um, details, then here's a comparison from one of the, from the published paper in the bottom right from our, our colleagues at UCD showing um, experimental uh, verification or validation of the modeling there shown from, on the previous slide for titanium 64 and 316 stainless steel. And it's showing for two different powers and it's showing comparison between the models on the left and experimental tracks on the right for single track laser um, melt pool with, so laser um, ablation, I suppose you'd say, of the, of the powder, compacted powder, um, and looking at melt pool with validation. And, um, and you're seeing about eight to 10% difference there, which I think is quite good. And that work's been published, as I said. And then I suppose uh, another key challenge in, in additive manufacturing is, that particularly if one is looking at properties and performance, is to try to identify defects. Uh, I think we're probably all aware of that. But um, and this th this slide shows an example of how that work um, on the previous slides can be applied to look at things like um, incomplete particle melting, void formation, and other instabilities that occur, leading potentially to defects. Um, then this slide shows some initial work from one of my PhD students at Galway on cellular automata modeling, which is it's basically two-dimensional work in this case. And essentially, it's looking at um, trying to capture the solidification process to for the microstructure, obviously, to look at the grain morphology um, and to try and capture that in computer models. And you can see that in this case, he's identified a particular problem uh, over on the right-hand side where grains are interpenetrating, which is a non-physical kind of um, non-physical phenomenon. And then he, he's identified that he needs to use, uh, in this case, the, 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 the cellular automata are, are the grains are nucleated by random nuclei with randomly assigned orientations. And then the colors designate the different orientations. Um, and then in this case, he's looking at and solidification process due to undercooling um, and the thermal gradients within the, within the that is specified within this um, unit cell model 
are basically driving that grain growth process in the in essentially in predominantly a vertical direction, as you can see there, which is quite similar to um, which is quite similar to what happens, in fact, within milk pools in the average manufacturing process. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And then in this particular case, the specific challenge that Majid, the PhD student, wanted to address, it was initial work looking at the linkage between cellular automata and crystal plasticity finite element modeling. So he basically wanted to um, you know, have a CA method to predict the microstructure, which you see in the top right here for a, for a, a, a strut, basically, a a, what's going to be a tensile loaded um, strut, um, which with an applied displacement, for example. And you'll see in a few minutes, we're, we're looking at this in the context of um, cardiovascular stents. Um, and then in this case, you can see that he's then converted that, he's, he's converted the CA model into a crystal plasticity so that the grain structure is predicted from the CA and then it's basically represented mechanically um, to get the behavior and the, the properties, if you like, or the performance um, using crystal plasticity modeling. And you can see then the strain distribution and some strain localization here associated with a particularly um, badly oriented grain, if you like, in terms of strain localization. And then in the top left, you can see the tensile stress strain curve predicted from that model. Um, and that was initial work that Majid conducted. Um, the, at the same time, our colleagues at UCD had developed a more complex three-dimensional simulation for a single laser track uh, solidification process uh, for representing additive manufacturing laser track. And you can see that that then predicts the microstructure, as you can see here, and the crystallographic orientation in, in this, um, implemented with an open form, actually. Um, and so the idea is that we would, we would take that and apply that with crystal plasticity as well. And that's basically ongoing work, which hasn't been uh, completed yet. The, the, the CA three-dimensional simulation is, is published in that work shown in the bottom right. Um, so one of the other kind of ideas, I suppose, that we have was, uh, and the PhD student working on, on this, Majid Kabusi here, um, we developed this idea, well, you know, we're always looking for kind of, um, I suppose, if you like efficient, so efficient ways to understand how the process affects the mechanical behavior. So in this case, we, we've, we're, we're thinking in terms of a generic coronary stent type design as shown in the bottom left. And to get the ball rolling, really, we, we started to think about the, um, the melt pool, which of course um, is really important in terms of the microstructures that result from additive manufacturing processes. And we've adopted a very simple approach here. In fact, it's, we call it a geometrically based process structure approach. So instead of using this CA, and this was really something he developed while he was perhaps waiting to develop the CA model, um, um, or before then, in fact. Um, it, and, and the idea was that we look at how, uh, in, knowing that the grains tend to orient themselves almost in a radial direction from the laser spot and grow associated with the thermal gradients in that direction that I'm, I'm I think you, if you can see my mouse moving there then I can turn on the pointer here actually um, so that the grains tend to grow in a radial direction within the melt pool and of course there are overlapping grains and there are lots of complexities here and in this particular case uh, let me see if we've got what we're showing is uni what we're thinking about here is unidirectional scans as shown by those red lines that I just depicted there and in particular we're interested in trying to identify uh, ge we've identified ge simple geometric relationships, which in fact avoid um, um, lack of fusion regions. So they avoid gaps. So it's a very simple geometrical relationship, essentially based on Pythagoras' theorem, which can be used to enhance the concept of specific laser energy density, which is an empirical parameter widely used to help to identify the optimal um, process parameters like hatch spacing and layer thickness, power, uh, laser power and scanning speed um, combinations of PV, HS and TL there in that parameter. But of course, it's quite empirical the way that's used. Um, and in general, there's a, people aim for a certain range of EV because they find that based on experience, you know, something like, for example, between 40 and 100 or something is found to give good behavior. And what we've identified is that with this geometrical relationship, we can identify a region which on the one hand um, is efficient in terms of the area deposited, so AD, which would be volume in a three-dimensional sense, 
but on the other hand, avoids these defects. So if we can stay within that range, then that can actually be used to enhance um, enhance the this this EV parameter and try to identify um, an optimal range. And that's kind of what we've done there. This this region here, the four, five, six region. But then we've 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 used that to we've mo used that this this approach to to basically generate crystal plasticity models are microstructures first of all as you see in the top right for a horizontally oriented specimen and in the bottom down here then the v so that's the ht6 specimen so what you see up in, the, in this image here are the melt pool geometries basically with these grains defined um, and randomly oriented um, the different colors represent random orientations apart from that as you said as i said that radial orientation but um and then in the bottom we've got um, a grain which is now oriented horizontally in the slide, but originally was built in a vertical orientation. So if you can imagine that, so we've turned it around because we're going to pull it and just to fit it on the slide, basically. And then these are subjected to tension because they're supposed to essentially be struts within this or little members, structural members within this stent, uh, one of those structural members, which are quite, quite small in dimensions, about 100 microns in width. And then I suppose one of the key points here is we're looking, in fact, at we're interested in, okay, hatch spacing effects, uh, but also orientation effects. So the horizontal and the vertical orientation effects. And what we find is that um, depending on the orientation of the build and this, for this for a given specimen, then you can have only, for example, about three grains across the key load carrying section, as you see in the top right here. Or in a vertical specimen situation, depending on the hatch spacing again, for example, you could have as many as seven or eight grains. So you can get a big variation in the number of grains for these micro scale structural members in this stent, if you like. So we've kind of chosen the stent for a number of reasons. One is because it's relevant to the, to the industrial context. Two, it's kind of easy to model the full width, the full load carrying section. So we can look at these effects in this particular case. And what we find then is that in fact, for the HT6 here, which only has three grains, we actually find the maximum ductility is only about 44% for that horizontally oriented specimen. Whereas for the vertically oriented specimen with a large number of grains across the load carrying section, it's about 55%. So we're seeing important microstructure phenomena here related to the build orientation. That's something we're interested in. That's for a particular hatch spacing. And then if we change the hatch spacing, to 0.7 and make a smaller hatch spacing. That was 1.6 hatch spacing um, uh, for H star, which is the, the ratio between the hatch spacing and the melt pool radius R. So that's about one and a half times the melt pool radius, basically. But if you have the hatch spacing smaller, then you can get essentially isotropic behavior. So orientation independent effects in terms of ductility, 50% maximum in both cases. And the reasons for that come down to the fact that it's it's got to do with how the, how the melt pool grains are oriented relative to the, the load carrying section. So that's what's going on here. So we can use the EV and then we can enhance that with the with um, the H star, if you like, and our crystal plasticity model to identify that below certain H star level or certain hatch spacing, we get good isotropic behavior, but above that we get anisotropic behavior. In general, one, one favors isotropic behavior. And then more particularly, one of the kind of attractions of this was that we could look at orientation effects. So, you know, you know, it's reasonably well known that, um, and it, there is some, perhaps variation of this um, in terms of the the degree, the qualitative the degree of disparity. But in general, you know, in general, the trend is that for tensile behavior, horizontal specimens tend to give a higher strength and a lower ductility. This will then drop off. This is the maximum strain here in this horizontal test. And then for vertical tests one tends to get lower strength, but larger ductility. And what we're showing here is that if we if we use our textured um, GBPS crystal plasticity models, we can capture qualitatively that higher strength, lower ductility of the horizontal and lower strength, higher ductility of the vertical trend. If we, if we don't implement the texture and we use a random orientation in our crystal plasticity um, melt pools, um, then so that we don't don't model that radial directionality of the of the grains, then we we essentially don't get the text the orientation effect. So I guess the key point is that um, 
that we can capture that effect if we incorporate this radial um, grain morphology that you can see that, as shown here on the right, which is consistent with the kind of general trend observed in, in additive manufacturing. So ongoing work in terms of this is, okay, we're extending our uh, geometrically based process structure property modeling to 3D. You can see some examples on the left-hand side here, and that will allow us to look at more complex scan patterns, for example, rather than just unidirectional. And we're doing that. We're also looking at adding porosity and defects, as you can see here, which is quite important phenomena in, in terms of um, behavioral and property structure, property performance behavior, particularly, for example, for fatigue, I, I guess. And then we're going to link to the 3D cellular automata as well, as you can see down in the bottom right. OK, so um, so then uh, some, some additional work. So that's based, I suppose, looking maybe at cellular automata modeling and crystal plasticity modeling for maybe process, you could say process structure property and performance. So at the same time, we've um, established a collaboration with India, um, a postdoc of ours at Galway within iForm, basically went and spent time, in fact, during COVID um, at India. Um, and, and we worked with Damien Toure there and Javier Segurado, um on developing phase field methods basically um, to look at the um, the heat tree or you know, I suppose microstructure evolution basically for heat treatment in particular of additive manufactured titanium 64 which is a key material in, in medical devices but also in aerospace um, <clears throat> so in particular we we folk we identified that Martin's IT composition um, was a phenomenon which hadn't been previously addressed within the context of phase field, for example, or, or, or in, in, in this kind of PSP. Um, so, and yet it's really important because, of course, additive manufacturing materials are heavily martensitic. Additive manufactured titanium 64 are heavily martensitic, and, and its martensite is detrimental in terms of ductility, for example, uh, and therefore toughness, et cetera. So this work is really looking at um, heat treatment um, processes for its annealing type processes to look at the Martin's IT composition, really. Um, and so um, I think the next slide maybe shows. So, so in fact, this ended up then being a collaboration with the University of Nottingham, where, where a chap called Marco Simonelli and within his group had conducted work on microstructure characterization, in situ microstructure characterization of actually manufactured, so laser powder bed fusion, titanium 6.4. Um, experimental, and then we've essentially come in and collaborated with them on the on the modeling side to look basically at um, at, the, at the phase field modeling. So we're looking basically at alpha prime, which is a HCP phase with high vanadium, so supersaturated vanadium concentration, alpha HCP phase with the equilibrium vanadium concentration, and the BCC beta phase with equilibrium vanadium vanadium concentration, and then. We're using phase field. I'm not going to show the equations in detail here. The details are shown in the Bacardo paper. He's Adrian Bacardo is the postdoc that worked on this, and it was published in Materials and Design uh, last year or this year, sorry, 2024. Um, but we're using phase field then, and, and in this case, we're using the eta eta i parameter. So the eta parameter is the phase parameter, and when it's equal to one, then we have alpha prime or alpha phases, and the alpha prime and alpha are distinguished by their vanadium concentration. And then when it's equal to zero, we have beta phase. Um, and then the, the, as I said, the alpha prime to alpha um, decomposition occurs um, by the vanadium concentration variation. Uh, um, and then <clears throat> we've looked at different, so we're focusing in on IPF, so inverse pole figure representation of the microstructure, and then we're capturing that as the initial condition in our phase field model. And then we've also done uh, developed a procedure actually to look at um, different orientations or different variants um, of, the, um, of the alpha um, phases. Um, I won't go through the details of that, but um, and that, that, that the different colors basically, so we've got six different colors here representing six different variants of the alpha phase. And then the, the, the white phase that you'd see is the um, beta phase. And then if you watch carefully the image on the left-hand side, you'll see it's actually, it should be an animation which is evolving. And this is, and you can see there's an increasing amount of white uh, along the boundaries of the alpha grains occurring. And that's the that's the beta phase. Um, alpha and alpha prime, are where the alpha prime is decomposing into 
alpha and beta phase in that animation. And essentially that corresponds to the temperature time history shown on the right hand side here, which is the temperature profile used for the uh, experimental in situ uh, simulation conducted or the in situ experiments, experiments conducted at the University of Nottingham um, in the center for additive manufacturing there. And you can see that's conducted for different, so the temperature time profile is shown here going from about, about 20 up to about 1,000 or short, about 950 degrees Celsius for various times. And then you can see the beta, the measured beta fraction is shown uh, by the red dotted curve, and that increases with time, obviously. Um, the two different red dots, they represent two different regions of interest, basically. And um, we're showing one of those regions of interest that the, the, um, the phase field model on the left hand side there. And then on this slide, I'm showing a comparison between the, the final EBSD measured microstructure for one of the regions of interest. Uh, the quality of correlation is the same. The quality of agreement is the same for the second region of interest. Uh, you'll find in that published paper. And then you can see specific um, grains shown here, A, B, C, D, E, and F, for example, in the EBSD image. And then you can see the corresponding grains identified in the phase field simulations on the right. And then a kind of a more generic verification or validation was initially used to, to verify the, the kinetics of the, um, of the process um, of, the of the decomposition of the phase transformation, basically, uh, by comparison with the experimental data, which are the purple dots here. The phase field simulations are the green dots. And then simple lever rule approach actually shows that you can capture quite well the beta volume fraction, but of course you won't get the texture. And the texture is very important as we've shown previously for the for the mechanical response of the of the of the material, so I suppose that's a key theme, the, the kind of theme of texture being really important. And this was supposed to emphasize that further. Here's another piece of work done um, on stainless steel in this case, specifically looking to try and capture some non-Schmidt type behavior for essentially si essentially single crystal type additively manufactured microstructures manufactured or, or printed at McGill University in Canada, actually. And this was a collaboration with McGill. I should have their uh, logo on the slide here. But so the experimental data in this case is on the right hand side. You can see that what the PhD student here, Shin Yu Yang, has developed um, again in collaboration with India, actually, Javier Sagrado at India, is a viscoplastic self consistent. So it's basically a polycrystal plasticity model. And the benefit of this is it's exceedingly fast, it will run in a, in a number of minutes compared to a crystal plasticity model, which will take many hours to run, typically depending on the volume and the number of grains, et cetera. So the polycrystal plasticity model, it won't capture the spatial distribution of the inhomogeneity of stresses and strains associated with the different crystals, but it will capture the bulk behavior. So it's excellent for capturing, for example, tensile response. Um, you essentially feed it a kind of an aggregate model based on the EBSD measured microstructure. Um, and then you can see in this case, we're getting a significant variation in terms of strain hardening behavior, strength, yield strength, ductility, et cetera, for the three different orientations of single crystal prints in this case. So the red, green, and the blue, basically. So, and, and the important thing here is that the model is capturing that trend. This was after significant work developing the slip twinning dislocation based latent hardening. Uh, if, uh, within the VPSC, for example. So when we first started looking at this and modeling it with the with the basic VPSC that was already available in open source, uh, actually came from actually came originally from Los Alamos um, um, uh, labs in the US. Um, and basically, um, um, we weren't able to capture this effect. So, so then, um, but so the, so the, the, so I suppose the slip twenty interaction, dislocation interactions on the one hand, and the latent hardening on the other hand were really important for this. The details are published in that MSEA paper down the bottom right. So then I mentioned that we're also looking to try and upscale to the part scale or to component level. So then um, this is a piece of work done by another PhD student of mine at Galway. In this case, he's actually using the abacus. Abacus is a, uh, you might know Abacus, it's a commercial finite element code, but it's a nonlinear computational mechanics code. Um, uh, but it's, um, so it's probably arguably quite useful for industrial transfer, tech transfer of the, of the results and the methods. But it's actually quite powerful. You can see the simulation in the top left of a 
um, the printing of a, a, a rectangular box type component. And this box type component is from the literature basically. And it's it's been thermocoupled, so it's been experimentally measured to the thermocouple temperature histories have been measured TC1 and TC2 down in the, in the bottom right. And you can see a comparison here between the model that, that Jin Bao developed in his work um, to capture these temperatures. And then of course, and he's, he's actually getting a really good comparison in this particular model. This is titanium 64 as well, actually. And then up in the top right, you can see a comparison, uh, essentially showing the temperature histories. These temperature histories, of course, are key to the phase transformations and the microstructure evolution driving something like a cellular automata model or indeed a phase field model. And, and of course, we're looking to link and drive the, the, um, the phase field and cellular automata models with these kinds of things now. And you, if you look down the table here, you can see that the cooling rate, which is particularly important, obviously, for phase transformations, um, Xinyu is getting uh, the experimental results about 220, and Xinyu is getting about 173. The previous work had only captured about 30, uh, that's degrees Celsius per second. So clearly, um, Jin Bao is getting excellent, uh, really good, really good improvement there in his modeling. And then one of the um, coming towards the end of the slide. So one of the one of the other key aspects that we worked on in phase one is the idea of trying to develop use artificial intelligence, suppose, or machine learning methods. And then another PhD project has basically um, looked at trying to train um, train a machine learning model, so a, a, an artificial neural network model, basically, with um, with crystal plasticity um, simulations. Um, to capture, to represent, to train it, to, un to recognize phase fraction and texture, and then to, if you like, to calculate or to determine the, the um, tensile response. So you can see here, we're looking at, um, you know, essentially, we have, in fact, generated a thousand crystal plasticity models with a range of different phase fractions and a wide range of different textures, trained the model with something like 750 of those crystal plasticity models. And then um, tested it, uh, you know, for the other 250 were used for verification and validation. And then here's a comparison for a real EBSD scan of this 17.4-pH um, steel sample. And then um, here's a comparison between the measured tensile response for that 17.4-pH steel sample, um, which is the blue dots. And then you can see the crystal plasticity is the red line, which is quite good. Um, and then the DNN prediction is the black line, which has been obtained from the trained uh, deep neural network model, basically. <clears throat> I suppose the key benefit of this is that, if you like, it takes that kind of multi-scale, uh, multi-physics type uh, capability, modeling capability, implements it in, a, in a, an AI tool, which then arguably or hopefully can be used by industry uh, much more rapidly. So, for example, in this case, the DNN model can give you a result in about a second. The full CPFE simulation takes about 13 hours. Of course, we know the reality is that there was a thousand CPFE simulations used to train this model. But I guess the idea is that somehow you're not losing that information and you're and you're able to use it so, um, efficiently. This is quite a busy slide. I used to animate it, but for time reasons, I, I've not animated it. Essentially, it's it's an attempt to try and convey the kind of vision that we're trying to develop for how all these different scales, so starting in the top left at the micro scale, the powder defect model, um, how the data can go from the modeling, um, both in terms of fabrication parameters feeding into the process powder data, thermal and defect data then feeding back into this hub, which is, if you like, a, a machine learning hub going down the center that kind of gathers all the data, if you like. Um, and then that feeds into uh, that thermal defect information from the powder from the powder defect modeling or the typically C, C, CFD type modeling feeds into the cellular automata type prediction. So for texture formation, that texture formation then one may want to look at specific phenomena with the phase field model, for example, to look at specific texture developments or mechanical uh, or microstructure type phenomena that will have mechanical effects, and then. The challenge then is to somehow capture that mesoscale type behavior in terms of either crystal plasticity models or polycrystal type um, 
you know, aggregate HLB type models, so grain matrix type models, um, as I've shown some examples of, and then feed those into part scale or component level models. This is a cardiovascular stent down the bottom right, for example, um, also showing a crystal plasticity model that one of our previous PhD students developed where essentially every grain is represented in this unit cell part of this um, periodic structure. And then ultimately trying to capture fatigue behavior, which is the key objective to, to uh, and that, that's down in the bottom right where we've developed, you know, scale consistent fatigue indicator parameters, which can be used to identify which grains um, in a scale consistent way to represent crack initiation and then try to understand how those cracks propagate. And ultimately to drive this through the machine learning hub across the various scales and physical phenomena of interest, so process, microstructure, uh, macrostructure, response, so mechanical response, and ultimately to come up with performance metrics, um, for example, fatigue life. Um, I think I've got, I've got a couple of slides on the offshore work, but I think in the interest of time, I, I might just skip forward to the, um, basically to the, um, to the conclusions. So, um, I mean, essentially, maybe maybe I should just say that we're looking to apply the same kind of methods to welded and um, um, welded and um, TMCP, so thermomechanically controlled processing of steel, so welding of TMCP steels for the next generation of offshore structures to look at size effects, for example, in such steels, and then how welding affects that for example, as well, to, to look at fatigue of welded connections. So, so but the, the key conclusions are, look, we're developing CA methods, for example, to look at microstructure evolution in various manufacturing processes, so powder bed fusion, welding. We're, we've developed polycrystal plasticity modeling to look at texture effects, so for powder bed fusion, laser-based so far, uh, we ultimately want to apply that to welding of offshore structures in our current projects. Um, phase field modeling, um, key aspects for that phase field modeling, a big challenge with phase field modeling is that you're looking at a very small region of interest, but key aspects that we've developed with um, India at, at Madrid, for example, are looking at implementing fast Fourier transform methods to accelerate that with um, parallel um, parallel coding with CUDA, for example, or sorry, Python CUDA and GPU programming as well is a very efficient tool that's being used for fast, efficient processing to try and, I suppose, upscale maybe, for want of a better phrase, that kind of texture evolution modeling. And then, you know, we've done some work on stent struts because they're convenient in terms of um, being able to capture the full cross-section. And then, but the key steps really are to join up the, what I might call the PSPP dots. So to join up these linkages, but ultimately to achieve reduced order methods or surrogate code for efficient industrial application of these methods. That's it, a lot of acknowledgements here to the various collaborators that I think I've mentioned a lot of them along the way. Um, and thanks very much, I'd welcome any questions. Um, Sean, I was wondering if you could actually summarize the uh, offshore work that you were, uh, that, that you spoke about only because we're interested in decommissioning of uh, offshore wind turbines and commissioning of new ones with steel structures. Absolutely, well, um, yeah, I mean, uh, hang on a minute now, let me see if I can, um, I mean, probably the easiest way is if I just, let me see if I can, I'm, I'm a bit lost here on the screen. Sorry, I've got, a, let me see where I am. Oh, sorry, yeah, I'm back here. Um, I, what I can do is just quickly, if, 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 if you indulge me quickly, just go back to that slide. Maybe there's one slide there, which maybe shows, and then I can, can you see that? I um, certainly can, yeah. Uh, let me just go back here. So, um, yeah, so maybe this slide shows. So, um, I guess the kind well, this shows some work we did on for X100, welded X100 for steel continuary risers. So again, well, I mean, the simple idea is, you know, um, for the for the offshore structures, the simple idea is that, you know, apparently, or I think it's fairly well known that there is a size effect for um, steel plate used for offshore structures, such as monopiles, for example. So if, if, if we want to upscale and have larger wind turbines and larger structures, then obviously, you know, we need to have thicker plate. But the contradiction thing, the contradiction is that as the plate gets thicker, then its fatigue strength reduces because of this size effect. So the idea is, 
um, of our project. And, you know, I, I can, as I'm starting to do it, I, I'm, I'm aware of weaknesses and, and I'm happy for people to point those out to me as well um, in the argument. But the logic is that we're going to try to understand how the microstructure um, forms in the TMCP process. We're going to use Gleba to study that experimentally, but we're going to use um, models of, let me see if I've got some, models of the rolling process to characterize the strain, temperature, time, histories to feed into a Gleebel. And then we're going to use the Gleebel results, hopefully, to understand what's happening through the thickness of, the, um, of a plate and, and the effects of different thicknesses of plate. And then we're going to try and look at how that affects texture, as shown, for example, in this image in the, in the center here. Um, this, is, this is an example of what we did for X100 steel for a welded connection. We're going to look at how the texture varies through the thickness, and then hopefully, uh, obviously, that we're also going to capture grain size effects as well as the idea. And then we're going to use, um, um, I suppose, size dependent or size sensitive, microstructure sensitive crystal plasticity or polycrystal plasticity models to, um, to simulate or to capture that computationally of course, trying to verify and validate that experimentally by mechanical testing of the Gleebel specimens or materials, etc. Uh, and that's the kind of idea to try and then somehow, we're obviously, the plan is also to look at how welding affects that. So that seems ridiculously ambitious, but um, we've got a team of researchers attempting to deal with that now. Um, and so the idea is to try and understand how the TMCP so the thermomechanical control process affects the microstructure as vis-a-vis -vis thickness and then how welding affects that in turn. And that, that's the kind of idea. And then to try and capture that in modeling is the kind of idea. I, I don't know. Does that answer the question, Samir? Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, that's brilliant. OK. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yeah, maybe one from me, um, uh, Pakash, it's uh, Didier Fauja from Tata Steel here. Yeah, yeah, Didier, yeah. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, just interesting. In, in your earlier slides, you mentioned CPS. And I'm just wondering in how much um, you know, work you are doing to potentially on your DNN uh, to embed physics on, on, on in CPS you know, for maybe a better control. Uh, of cyber physical systems or acting onto the process as you are manufacturing it. So uh, embedding more and more physics, uh, even at the scale of the, the macrostructure of the texture, for instance. Yeah, I guess um, I do here. Um, um, I certainly, I think I know, I certainly know of you, and we may have met at one time before. Nice to meet you again. But um, <laughs> basically, um, well, I think maybe that's a key challenge in phase two. Um, that we've started to identify. Um, I suppose we haven't, uh, I, I guess that is, I suppose that's ongoing work, I suppose, Didier. Um, and um, I guess we haven't, the, the, the methods that we've used so far um, haven't really done that. I mean, so I think I'm probably a bit ignorant to be absolutely honest about exactly, uh, have you got particular things in mind there? I mean, I, I can't quite, I, I almost, uh, it, um, I'm, I'm personally, I'm still kind of on a bit of a learning curve with respect to machine learning. Um, we are the particular PhD student we had who was working on crystal plasticity, developed, used TensorFlow, um, and then he implemented, he, he trained his model. You know, he, he had, in fact, it was a collaboration with colleagues in iForm at Maynooth University in Ireland, and in fact. Um, with, uh, it was a, another collaboration, in fact, with, um, uh, that led to that work. So I would say I personally am not very strong on machine learning. Um, and I certainly, I don't, I think I'm probably starting to read and try and understand how physics-based methods could be implemented. Or have, are there particular ideas that you think are, could be captured or... Yeah, I was just th thinking more in terms of, of real time, um, you know, embedding more physics uh, within the sensor itself, um, you know, um, by, you know, running, you know, DNN, you know, embedding the, you know, the physics you've, you've captured within this uh, deep neural network, for instance, whether you have then the, the ability to 
to to control better the process you know uh um, you know, by measuring, you know, through sensors, but also modeling the effect on the product, for instance. So maybe you have then the ability to to look at strength path, temperature path, and so on effect, and 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 you know, uh, having you know uh, in more real time uh, embedded, you know, sensing and and modeling in a way. I think. Thank you very much, Julian. You've actually helped me a lot. Because I'm, okay. <laughs> apologies for being so ignorant of my answer. My no, colleagues no, and okay. I form would hit me over the head now, I think. But basically, yeah, I mean, Dermot Brabazon and Dennis Dowling, for example, are working on a lot of sensorization of AM methods. And they're, they're you know, taking apart their, for want of a better phrase, taking apart their 3D printers and embedding sensors in there. And then, of course, so the idea of the crystal plasticity models that we've developed is to try to aim for near instant, so that 1.27 seconds, for example, mm. um, that kind of idea to, to, if you take a scan of, um, try to take a scan in some way, I suppose one would need to do some kind of in situ process. But so I think we are starting to look at correlations between defects temperature peaks, temperature time histories, so measured, so from sensor, from sen from in situ sensors, uh, to look at the temperature traces, the temperature patterns, and then try and link those to defects. But I guess I can't claim that the crystal plasticity, st I mean, somehow um, I, I, I'm, we haven't done, we perhaps, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't, maybe it's possible to try and move towards having some kind of an EBSD scan or some kind of a, and in, I don't know if it's possible to get that. I mean, that seems like a big challenge to get that into or to try and extract something from an in, from a, an in situ process and then try and feed that into a, a machine learning model. But I guess maybe in the long run that can be possible. Um, but, uh, you know, um, so that, that sounds quite interesting. But certainly, yes, our colleagues in iForm, my colleagues in iForm are definitely working on that within Platform One, for example. And I certainly haven't got any, I, I perhaps should have, but I don't have any specific slides to show that here. But I'd certainly be happy if there are questions to put you in touch with with, with um, the people working on that. Okay. Okay. Many thanks, Sean. Yeah, great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Yeah, you should. Hi. Um, thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, my question is, is very... So you talk about advanced manufacturing. I, I'm trying to understand the definition. What do you mean advanced manufacturing? So that's one a simple question. Uh, I think it was in the beginning, uh, the second question is in the beginning, you talk about, you didn't really talk about, but in the slides, you show something designed for sustainability and also sustainability modeling. So is there any more information about those two things? Okay, uh, let me see if I can go back. Um, uh, uh, yeah, th thanks very much, um, Lee. Uh, um, so um, yeah, I, I, I suppose advanced manufacturing, well, okay. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, um, and, um, I certainly don't claim to be, I don't claim to be, um, you know, the, the, wor the world's greatest expert on definition of what, what, what constitutes advanced compared to, um, but I guess, um, you know, let me give you maybe an example that springs straight to mind. Um, if you look at composites manufacturing, okay, then quite a lot of composites manufacturing is quite, you could say, craft-based. So, um, you know, um, still a lot of manual layups going on. But then on the other hand, you've got something like automatic tape placement machines, which are digitally controlled, for example. So to me, that's an example of an advancement in manufacturing methods, but still quite a lot of composites manufacturing. And we know the composites are really important in terms of aerospace, for example. But still, it seems to me quite a lot of composites manufacturing takes place in a kind of a craft-based um, methodology so so that's one big challenge then i suppose to, to try to, you know and and i'm not a composites manufacturing expert at all but similarly if if we look at i suppose for me also if we look at so i suppose one definition of advanced manufacturing to me would be 
um, digitally controlled, so computer controlled manufacturing. To me, that would be one definition. But for me personally, as someone who's kind of grown up in a, you know, as an engineer in a kind of a digital world, um, although I did start doing drawing by hand and then eventually, I suppose, maybe did some CAD as a PhD student. Um, but I think in terms of the world of finite element, for example, and computational mechanics, and I think, well, does computational mechanics influence manufacturing processes? And uh, so to me, uh, that's a massive challenge for um, computational mechanics um, industry, but also for manufacturing industry. How can we actually leverage the understanding of how a grain structure affects mechanical performance um, to design better, better, um, uh, uh, better um, components? And then maybe that leads a little bit to um, some of this uh, is not really so. Um, so I suppose to a certain extent, if you look at this 20% reduced design iterations on this slide, I'm uh, not sure if you see that, but so to me, I kind of think, well, you know, can we somehow, and this is at least part of what we're trying to do in iForm within one of the, within one of the work packages. Um, can we somehow integrate, and this is probably a bit of a holy grail, how can we somehow integrate computational mechanics, for example, which might be a back-end post-processing uh, activity normally in manufacturing, and one has to be really careful how one deploys that because it can be very time consuming, obviously. But how can we, you know, if, how can we get that to somehow influence what's happening at the design stage, at the CAD stage, or pre CAD stage, even at the conceptual stage? How can we get these things to be integrated? And could that lead to reduced design iterations and engineering effort, that 20%, for example? Could it lead to a better? Design for you know design for recycling, design for assembly. You know, you know, could it lead to better life cycle impact, or reduced energy usage? You know, re reduced you know for want of a better phrase, messing around with experiments, time time consuming experiments, for example. Th that's the kind of I don't know if that answers your question or not, but yeah, yeah, that's yeah, an attempt. I, I, yeah, I think yeah, it's wonderful answer. Um, uh, why I asked questions is the first question is we also at the moment where sometimes we think about what we are working on. For example, we talk about loads about high value manufacturing, but we are mainly uh, particularly this group. Majority people are working on steel. We we sometimes a question ourselves. Also, people question us what we are working on is high value manufacturing or not in terms of the steel making or steel manufacturing, or is steel manufacturing considered advanced manufacturing or not? So that's the question why, why, why I ask you this question. So what kind of um, research you uh, in your eye form about the sustainability uh, modeling? Okay, that's a good question. Um, and I'm, um, okay, that, that's a good question. Um, and I might be the best person to answer it, but um, um, so, sorry, just, you said the life cycle, sorry, just ask, just, just read so, again. So, so sustainability modeling oh. is, is, uh, is, you have many talk about uh, uh, life cycle assessment. Yeah, life cycle assessment, that's one of the key, th key aspects, but now, okay. yeah. um, so one of my colleagues at UCD, has done a lot of work on design for, he's done a lot of work on manufacturing processes, for example, assembly processes. So uh, now that doesn't quite fit in. I-Form was essentially established, uh, I suppose, really, you know, like in lots of things, one needs to focus, at least that was our, our approach. So we decided to focus on materials processing initially, experimental, modeling, AI, et cetera. So the assembly process, so design for assembly really doesn't quite fit into materials processing. But what we're trying to do is take the life cycle assessment methods that he's and capability he's developed. Uh, it's Nikos, Nikos Papadopoulos. Um, maybe I haven't got his surname, his surname correct there now, but he's a Greek chap at UCD. Uh, I can put you in contact with him, for example, or if, you know, I can send you some of his um, um, citations or whatever, or references. But um, so he's basically looking at life cycle methods okay. so carbon footprint um, hmm. 
methods and developing software. And I suppose the idea is to try to bring that back into, uh, and that's a big challenge for us. How are we going to link that into the materials processing work? It hasn't, we're not looking at steels. Um, not, I mean, I've got a project on steels, but that's outside iForm actually. Um, okay. Within iForm, we're not specifically looking at steels. In fact, within iForm phase two, where we've identified two materials that we're mainly going to focus on, which are titanium 6.4 and nitinol. Um, and, um, but, but, but we will have other activities as well. There's a little bit of work on composites, very little work that I can think straight off on, certainly not on large, more on stainless steel, for example, for medical devices, for example, or maybe for, so they're the kind of main kind of materials that we're looking at. Ah, okay, cool, cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah.